up, we have Alana Bellis. She, I hope I pronounced that correctly. She is- It's okay, nobody uh, does. It's all good. I, know, right? I always have to look at it a couple of times. I'm like, okay. Um, <laughs> Alana is an entrepreneur, business owner, mother, dog mama of some real cute pups, crazy Seahawks fan. Her one dog is named Seahawk. A live music lover, passionista, and a nerd. I have to say self-identified. I'm not calling her a nerd. Uh, most of all, she is what she never thought she would be. She is a teacher, not of kids, but of grown-ups, and often teaching those that come from culturally diverse and varied socioeconomic backgrounds. Full disclosure though, Alana really, really wanted to be Oprah. She wanted to be Oprah, she wanted to have a Gale, or the Prime Minister. And you know what, to be honest, what I know of Alana, she'd do a dang good job of those jobs. With her talk today, The Road Less Traveled, here is Alana. Karen, thank you so much for including me in this amazing and inspiring event. I'm just, honestly, I'm, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to connect with each and every one of you. The stories that I've heard so far have brought me to tears a couple of times. Um, so thank you all for just being open to listen to my story. And I'm just really grateful. I know that we all have so much in common, including resilience, strength, passion, and most of all, determination. Tonight, I want to talk with you about four things. Mistakes, rising when I felt like I was drowning, the road less traveled, and the yes challenge. How many of you, and I know you're on mute, so it's okay, you can do reactions if you want, but how many of you are in, are in the exact place that you thought you would be when you were five, 10, 20, anybody? Anyone think that they're, are you in the exact place that you thought you would be? Probably not. <laughs> and have any of you ever looked back on your life and thought to yourself, boy, have I made so many mistakes, or I wish I'd done this, or I wish I'd done that. Anyone? Yeah, if, I, if it were decent to put my legs up, I totally would. <laughs> the definition of mistake is an action or a judgment that is misguided or wrong. And I want us to actually marinate on that for a minute. So it's an action or a judgment that is misguided or wrong. Tonight, I would like to talk about how I changed my mindset from feeling like I was a failure to finding that the road less traveled was the path that led me to finding myself and ultimately being fearless in my pursuit of this life. When I was a little girl, I had a pretty idyllic childhood. I came from a middle-class family. I come from a long line of teachers and strong matriarchs. These women, women ruled the roost. And even if they didn't have the designation of teacher, they were all teachers. So I knew that I was never going to be a teacher. It was just never going to happen. Uh, when I was little, I was the smart, precocious, feisty one. I asked way too many questions and I wanted to do way too many things. I, you know, in the 80s and 90s, girls and boys still weren't entirely the same. And it was, you were just too much. You are too much. You want too much. You too much, too much. And that was a theme in my life. And I was often told that I had to reinvent the wheel in order to be happy. And they were right. It was, it was the, the symphony of my life, the, the soundtrack, those phrases. I was the overachiever in school. I aspired to do something that would help shape, influence, grow, and more importantly, inspire others. So Karen's right. I wanted to be prime minister or Oprah in the 80s, not necessarily now Oprah, but definitely 80s Oprah. You get a car, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. Um, or 90s, I guess, because the 90s were the best decade. Anyways, uh, after being accepted into UBC after high school, in my second year at the naive age of 19, something happened for me, not to me, for me, 
that changed my life. I was pregnant. Everything stopped. Everything changed and nothing was ever going to be the same again. Many people probably, I know probably for sure, whispered that I'd made a mistake, that I'd ruined my life, but I didn't think of it that way at all. Was it my plan? Hell no. But was it my path? Hell yes. Rising when I was drowning. Because of my amazing daughter, Olivia, I worked, I studied, I worked some more to ensure that I gave her the very best possible life. When I was 25, I had my second daughter, Amelia, and my two angels were my raison d'etre. Everything was for them. I was at the time in an extremely abusive marriage and at, because of everything that was happening in my life, I had never experienced poverty like I did at the time. I was the sole breadwinner and I was going to school part-time to complete a master's degree, traveling for my job and trying to just stay afloat, living on about two hours of sleep most nights, teaching, momming, schooling, fighting with husbanding, all that stuff. And I remember thinking to myself in the depths of my despair, what the holy H-E double hockey sticks have I done with my life? I am a failure. I can't believe this is my life. Definition of mistake, an action or a judgment that is misguided or wrong. Marinate on that. I remember worrying that others could see all the mistakes I was making. Like they were looking at me and seeing the mistakes. It was like I was walking around with a sweater saying mistake, 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 failure, 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 failure. And because I had to reinvent the wheel I had created, I'd chosen this chaos of a life. I sat in this sadness for a time and I remember clearly looking at my girls and deciding that this wasn't a mistake. It was part of the road less traveled and I was going to push through the weeds and debris and find the light for them and for me. So let's recap for a second, shall we ladies? I was 26, poor, divorced almost twice, and I had two babies, winner, winner, chicken dinner. I literally was like, superstar queen, baggage, here she is. But you know what? Even in the depths of feeling like I had made a million mistakes, I just knew if I stayed on this road I was on, it would take me and my girl somewhere great. It was my road. And I was determined to navigate based on fearlessness rather than fear itself. And then I got my shot. I had been a corporate facilitator for a few years and I had just launched my business. Exciting things were happening. I was a finalist for the Surrey Board of Trade Business Women of the Year and almost immediately clients came in. I was starting to see the flowers along my road. But in 2009, I got a phone call that would change my life. I had been scouted to be the senior project manager of training and development for the Vancouver 2010 Olympic Games. This project would be a two year project and I would have to stop everything in my life to focus on this Olympic sized opportunity. I didn't even hesitate when offered the position, I just said yes. Through that project, I was often asked to do things I'd never done before, including in organizing a multi-day media event. I said yes. I said yes to opportunities every single day without thinking about whether or not I would fail. I just said yes. I said yes to being the senior project manager of training for the G8G20 in Toronto and many exciting and once in a lifetime events. I finally realized that my choices led me to exactly where I needed to be. 
I spent two years jumping into the deep end every single day and opening myself up to every single opportunity that presented itself to me. And I've kept that mantra for the past decade. Yes, say yes. I met the love of my life after closing myself off to love and connection. And I've tried to instill the yes mantra in my angels' lives by seizing every opportunity, like tonight, uh, that presents itself and looking at our choices as miles or kilometers on our road less traveled. Because I say yes, I've built a business that's, that has a course catalog of over 90 programs and courses. Because I said yes, we license our curriculum to colleges and universities across Western Canada. Because I said yes, we have a division dedicated to creating high quality, specifically crafted education for Indigenous learners. Because I said yes, I work with executives, people with trauma, nonprofits, and Fortune 500 com com companies. Because I said yes, we built an online corporate university in order to pivot through COVID. Because I said yes, I have two incredibly incredible daughters. Because I said yes, I'm here with you tonight. So my challenge for all of you, your brilliant, amazing, strong, caring, thoughtful, self-aware women, my challenge is to say yes for one month. Say yes when your gut tells you to. Say yes to opportunities. Lunch with strangers. Zoom lunches count too. Say yes for a month and know that you can never make a mistake because your choices are creating your road less traveled that will be paved with happiness, authenticity, and joy. Your superpower or your story is your superpower. And because it is yours, it can never be a mistake. I have a confession to make. I haven't made mistakes. I've followed my untamed heart. I loved hard and I've worked even harder. I have made choices that many advised against. I've persisted, picked myself up, dusted myself off and I said, yes, I put myself out there. I have been hurt. I have found love. I did not fail. I found myself on this road less traveled. And I leave you with this from The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Thank you for listening. That was great, Alana. I'm just looking at some of the comments on Facebook, which is a bit delayed, but um, rising when drowning, that is amazing. What a concept. And uh, Melissa is just commenting on Facebook how um, it's so applicable that, that, that saying, even in current times. And the say yes, like, I love it. I love it. And I love how through your story, we can see how your mistakes are really your learnings, like how you, you've actually learned to look fear and, and, and know, and, you know, know that there's nothing to fear, but fear itself, as people say, you know, uh, be curious about what's on the other side of fear and try to force through. <laughs> and, you know, it takes a village and you got to look at the people around you and who is there to support you as you're going through those tough times. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm for one proud of you. I'm sure a lot of people connect with your story and, and some of your struggles and some of the things that you've gone through. Um, and I really hope that uh, they reach out to you as well if, if they want to chat. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alana. That was wonderful. Just flip through my notes here. Next we have Karen Reed Sadu. Let's get my notes ready here. Karen is actually a senior business development professional with over 30 years experience spearheading projects within the private, public, and nonprofit sector. She is the most confident, determined, and focused person I know when it comes to challenges. You want her in your corner, let me tell you that. She has a huge heart with an incredible passion to give back. 
leading a nonprofit agency as their executive director, her number one priority is community safety and youth mentorship. A graduate from the University of UBC Soder School of Business with her talk, Survivor, My Past Does Not Define Me. Here is Karen. Wow, thank you, Karen. Let me tell you, I'm so inspired by the women that I've heard today. Um, this is the first time I've actually spoke publicly about uh, my story. I was approached by a friend of mine, Shelly, who just launched Pursuit 365. And she asked me, would you like to be in our book? And I said, okay. And I thought what I was going to talk about. And then I thought to myself, you know what? It's time for me to share my story about my life experience and who I am today and what, what shaped me. And it, some of it was good and some of it was bad. But when I was nine years old, I'll never forget, I was at my grandmother's farm in Cornwall, Ontario, and I had a fever and I was not feeling great. So my family went out to go pick apples because she had an apple orchard. She had 99 acres and I was lying in bed and all of a sudden my uncle decided to join me. And at that time, I was really, I was nine. I was naive. I had, I had looked at the world through you know, unicorns and, and rainbows. And I was just really um, innocent. Well, he stole that for me that night. He stole that for me and it distorted my life at that moment. I didn't know how to live through that. I felt confused, the guilt, the shame. He told me not to tell anybody and I listened to him. When I was 13 years old, I was babysitting for my dad's friend and he had two little boys. And I remember I fell asleep on the couch and again, another man decided to try and take advantage of me and he succeeded. I didn't know what to do. I was, I, I got dressed after and I ran home and I, my dad asked what was wrong. Until I was 16 years old, I told my dad at that point, what had happened, he wanted to kill my uncle. He wanted to kill his friend, but I said, don't. But what happened when you, when you go through something like that in your life, it distorts things in a way that you never really understand until you finally seek help. I chose partners with vulnerability. I was really vulnerable. I didn't have the self-esteem at that point. It's funny people today say, I don't believe that, but it's, it's true. I didn't have any self-esteem at the time. And I met my ex-partner and he put me through some serious abuse. I was in the hospital twice. I ended up in a transition home with my two-year-old son. And then I finally had shame and guilt and everything else thrown at me from his family who grew up in the West side in Caresdale. They were an affluent family. And I remember his mother vividly saying to me, you got the East involved now because I phoned my father. I phoned my father because I was sitting in a park with a bottle of wine and a bottle of pills. And I, I was going to kill myself that night. But my dad's voice went off in my head. My dad was an army drill sergeant, and he, but I was, his, I was his princess. So he said to me, call me. I, this voice went off, so I called him and I told him what had happened. And he said, I'm coming out. He came out, he helped me get settled. I left, I, I, I went to get help. I broke, the, I broke the pattern by seeking help. And I know so many women in my life, after telling my story to them, they said, I'm living a mirror image of you because I went through the same thing, whether it was their grandfather, uncle, brother, father, boyfriend of the mother. It could have been anybody in their family, but they shared it. It's not easy to move past the memories. There's certain things that trigger my memories, smells, words, experiences that pop up. It's really quite something that you could be sitting in the forest and the smell will come up and it reminds me of that 
day that I was nine years old. There are so many women with these wounds who feel that too, they're too embarrassed or ashamed to speak about it. But I empower you and I give you the approval you need to speak about this because we need to speak about this. One in three young women and young boys are molested every day. It's just, it's just something that I can't even comprehend that our society is so, it's just, it's just so corrupt with, with the abuses that happen to children. And back in the day when it happened to me, nobody talked about it. Our family was, Shh, don't say anything. Well, my cousin was 19 when she committed suicide because of my uncle. So over the years, I've met so many strong women who helped me find the courage to face these demons. And they are demons. Now my focus is on helping others to find the strength to overcome adversity. And Karen hit the nail on the head. One of my passions is youth. I want to help youth to find the voice to get and the strength to be able to stand up to what is troubling them in their lives. It's never been worse as it is now with COVID and the isolation the youth are feeling. So I want them to know that it's okay to speak about the things that they are going through. It's okay to tell people that you're being bullied. It's okay to tell people that you're going through an abuse. Talk to an adult. And I want to say that I've been married to my husband for 34 years this July. And he's my life partner. I have three amazing youth uh, kids that are not youth anymore. They're all adults now, sorry. <laughs> and I have two sons and a daughter, and I'm so proud of them. My uh, oldest son is in Kelowna and he has a business. My daughter works for the government. And my youngest son is a police officer in Vancouver. My husband's a retired police officer. And I can tell you right now that our family is committed to public safety and my commitment to public safety is huge, but my commitment to youth today has never been stronger. And I want to encourage each and every one of you to reach out to youth in your life to help them find their voice. On this final note, I wanna say this. I want everybody to hold up your hand like this. And I don't know if you've seen the ad on TV, but if you ever see this in a Zoom call or any situation where you're talking to another person and they go like this, that means that they need help. So I wanna thank everybody today for listening. That was my first time ever sharing it. And I, I feel so, I just feel so blessed to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Big virtual hug. I was reading the comments and I literally think everybody wanted to lunge through the through the yeah. through their phones and their iPads and their computers to just give you a hug. Um, I, I thank you for for allowing this to be the vessel for you to share your story for the first time. And I hope that that story continues to be shared. Um, it's I'm sorry that you've gone through that. And we know that many, 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 I mean, you rattled off the stats there. It's happening all the time. And the fact that, um, you know, it's not just girls, it's boys as well. Um, but Karen, I, I, I love everything that, that you do and everything that you stand for, particularly with your commitment to youth uh, mentorship and, and youth engagement and youth involvement. It's incredible. Um, you are incredible. And uh, thank you again so very much for sharing that story. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Karen, can I just say something to Karen to do? Yeah. Yes. Um, the other thing is because you're, I've worked with some of the youth that you have um, mentored with the Surrey Crime Prevention. And not only are you mentoring them then because of their volunteering and the programs that you have them do, you're actually helping them end up becoming police officers with the RCMP and with different city police. So you're saying that you're helping them is actually doing a greater service to community as a whole when they become members. So I'm very proud of you. Good job. Huge ripple effect, huge domino effect. Yeah.
Yeah, it's awesome. Thank you, thank you. Next up is my sidekick tech support. <laughs> thank you, Melody. She's been uh, helping me along here because we keep getting booted out of the Facebook Live and things are happening and she just, she's wonderful. She's amazing. She's an empowerment and visibility coach. She does a lot more of these than I do. So she's, she's, uh, she's been fantastic. So Melody is, uh, as I said, she's an empowerment and visibility coach for female entrepreneurs. So another uh, women supporting women gal here. Uh, she's a divorced dog mama from Surrey, BC. And her first rock bottom came with the end of her marriage. In this series, she'll talk about her second rock, bot her second rock bottom shortly after, how she came back stronger each time and how she created a life that she now absolutely loves. With her talk, Rock Bottom to Total Freedom, here is Melody. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Am I unmuted? I am. Um, I'm just, I just want to start off by saying I feel so empowered and inspired by the stories that I've heard so far and just feel like I resonated with each one of them. And I wish I could just reach out and hug you all because just amazing. So I just wanted to start off by saying that. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk about actually both rock bottoms and uh, how how that came about and kind of how I worked through the process. So yeah, I'm going to start when uh, I was 27 years old. I married a really great guy, or at least I thought at the time, <laughs> which seems to be a common thread. Um, he treated me well. We had the same dreams. We never fought. We just got along. Everything was easy. We were happy. And four and a half years into our marriage in May, 2017, I discovered that he had been having multiple affairs throughout our relationship that even went all the way back to when we first started dating, uh, which I didn't find out about till much later. So basically, you know, our entire relationship, he was always with somebody else. And I found out that his latest affair was with a teacher that he worked with. And in one morning, my entire world was turned upside down. Everything that I knew was all backwards. Uh, I was in so much shock that I could not fully function for at least a week. Uh, I had so much grief. I had anger. I had shame. I had guilt because, of course, him cheating must have had something to do with me. Right. Must have been my fault. And I just felt so lost. Uh, I developed PTSD and I was so worried that I would spiral into depression again, which is something that I battled a lot in my twenties. And some people think that you can only get PTSD when you experience something crazy traumatic, but you can get PTSD experiencing any degree of trauma. And to me, this was traumatic. Um, after a couple of tumultuous months with him moving in and out of our house and us trying to decide our future, I decided to move out of our house and start a new chapter. Problem was, I had no idea what that was going to look like, and I had no idea where to start. I felt like I had hit rock bottom, like 32, 33, can't remember how old I was, and I was starting over. So much who, of who I was was connected to him. Like I had lost who I was in that relationship and essentially I had to recreate me. And in the first six months of being newly single, I started, I dipped my toe in. I started to learn how to love myself. I started to do, to do things just for me. Um, so I started dating right away, which was a nightmare, but I did it. Um, because I needed to know that I was still attractive, that, you know, there wasn't something wrong with me that, you know, I was going to be okay. Um, I bought a paddleboard, I bought a new townhome, which I'm in right now. Um, I spent a lot of time with friends and family and in places that I loved. So I went to the beach a lot. I reached out to friends and families and counselors for help because I knew that I needed to build a tribe to help me through this extremely difficult time. And being alone was a bit hard at this point. Okay, that was a lie. It was really, really hard. Uh, and I had not done it in a really long time. I had been with him for the better part of a decade. So super hard, especially since I had my ex messaging me in the middle of the night all the time, telling me that he wanted me back, that I was his princess, that he'd never stop loving me. And of course, he was still with 
we'll call her the mistress because that's the nicest name I can think of. Um, and so I would wake up in the morning and these messages would have my head spinning, like one text from him and I'd be a mess for days, just days. So we decided on sharing custody of our dog, which is sort of where the second part of the story comes in, which I later realized was his only way of holding on to me and his way of controlling um, being able to see me every week. And it was all a control thing for him. So it was really hard for me to move on. And later that year, I developed um, a new issue with a chronic ear problem that I have uh, and I had to take some time off work. I was lying in bed waiting for my upcoming surgery. And the reality of my situation hit me like I'm really on my own now. What if I can't go back to teaching because this ear thing doesn't improve? Like, what if the surgery doesn't work? How am I going to pay my mortgage? Um, I don't want to teach anymore, but what the heck am I going to do? Because I have a master's in education. So my options, I felt, were kind of limited. And I didn't have a significant, significant other to rely on like I did before. So the next day, I started an online business in affiliate marketing, and I was introduced to personal development. And I'd always been a fan of self-help books. In fact, my ex made fun of me of it all the time. He's like, oh, another self-help book. Um, but these marketers believed in personal development so much. It was like self-help on steroids. And this was without a doubt the beginning of my new chapter. So throughout 2018 and 2019, I truly healed myself from the PTSD. I learned how to love myself, how to be on my own, how to enjoy spending time with myself. Um, I adopted a new mantra that there wasn't anything that I couldn't do, especially anything I couldn't do that a man could. I was determined to learn how to do all sorts of things. So I started woodworking, which became a side hustle. I built a shop in my garage, worked on my online business. I traveled as much as I possibly could. I learned how to do all the blue jobs around the house, like electrical and plumbing. And I was I loved it. Like I loved being able to do all those things and not having to need someone else in my corner. Um, by 2019, probably I'd say halfway through 2019, completely different person. I decided to quit teaching because I could see the potential in working online and I just didn't love teaching anymore. I was not passionate about it. It was something that you know, my ex and I shared together and I, I, you know, we were even in the same school district and it was just like, I gotta get out. Um, so I quit in June, 2019, which was really good timing right before the pandemic. And of course I had it all planned out. My online business was going to flourish because I had all this free time. You know, my side business was going to bring in some nice extra cash and 2019 was going to be my year. And it really was in a sense, but as we all know, sometimes the universe has a different plan for us. And in the fall of 2019, I told my ex I wasn't going to share the dog with him anymore. I said, this is done. Um, long story short, he was always making my dog sick and I thought he was going to end up killing him. So um, I was like, nope, this is not happening anymore. Standing up for myself and standing up for my dog. And he sued me. <laughs> so in the winter of 2019, a few months after I stopped receiving paychecks from the school district, I realized I was sinking very quickly financially. Uh, I spent a lot of time working on my businesses, but that money was just not coming in. So now I had to pay for a lawyer and for court. And a few friends and family members asked me, why didn't just give him the dog? Or why didn't just keep sharing? Can't be that bad, they said. Like, it's just a dog. So I can't see all of you, but, but let me know in the comments, like any fur mamas out there? right? Karen, Karen knows what I'm talking about. Um, any fur mamas without human children? So my dog is my child. My ex and I tried for a couple years to conceive and we couldn't. So my dog became my entire world, like everything. And now after having affairs for our entire relationship, after turning my life upside down, he now uh, you know, after all that I had done for him, he now wanted to take my dog away from me, like take my only child away from me. I was not going to let him do that. That was not going to happen. Um, and besides that, like my dog is my whole life. How would I even make it a day without him? So in order to start help paying for things, I started to sell everything in my house I possibly could. I'm telling you everything. I sold my bedroom furniture. I slept on a mattress on the floor for months. 
Uh, actually, I'm still sleeping on a mattress on the floor. I sold some of my tools. I sold my paddleboard that I love so much. I sold whatever I could get my hands on. I got a job serving at a restaurant working for $12 an hour. And I started tutoring on the online because the pandemic had just hit. And I tried to get back into teaching, but the universe sent me a very clear message that that was not going to happen. And that was not in my path. And so like Karen, I listened to my gut. And in 2020, in February, I found myself hitting rock bottom for the second time now in three years. But this time it was a lot harder because I had to make the choices on my own. In the first situation, my husband kind of made those choices for me, right? Then the universe gave us a pandemic. <laughs> so lost my job at the restaurant, definitely didn't want to teach now. And I even put my house up for sale and considered seriously living in a tiny home or a trailer park or whatever, just to make ends meet, just to be able to keep my dog. Because as long as I had my dog, I'd be happy. So throughout this entire time, even though the future was super unclear and I felt I was slowly losing my grip on control, like over my life, I knew that my second comeback was going to be even more epic than the first. And I told everyone that. So in March, I gave up my online business. I realized that I truly, truly missed helping people and I didn't love selling someone else's products day in and day out. I thought I could help people through difficult times and help them the way that I helped myself get through rock bottom. And I'd heard of coaching at hired coaches before and I thought, you know what, I could see myself doing that. Because even though I was alone, even though dating sucks in your 30s, you guys, it sucks, okay? Online dating, I don't recommend it. And even though I left my teaching career and I was making zero dollars, I was still happier than I have ever been in my entire life. And I knew that I could help women be happy too. So I uh, started my, my coaching business in April, 2020, uh, becoming you know a business and personal development coach. And the legal stuff with my dog was wrapping up. I paid $25,000 to keep my dog but essentially it was to get my ex-husband to leave me alone so um, I could move on with my life. And you might think, okay, this crazy dog lady paid a lot of money for her dog, but it was to me essential. It had to happen. Um, and it gave me that peace of mind because he can't contact me anymore. I no longer wake up with messages in the morning from him. And this last year, has flown by. I've put everything into my business, um, you know, grew it from the ground up. I ended up not having to sell my house. I didn't have to go back to the restaurant. I could say no to that. And I definitely didn't have to go back to teaching. And I get to help other female entrepreneurs every single day. So now I have a purpose again. So have the last two years been an emotional and financial roller coaster? Absolutely. But in that chaos, I was able to create a life that I really loved. And you can too. The key is to create a vision of what you want in your life, and you need to be specific as possible and visualize that life on the daily. Never let it out of your sight. Stay true to your dreams and your goals for the future. And you have to be resilient. If something happens to throw you off course, you got to find your way back or pivot if you have to. So find that tribe of women also who are going to have your back and support you on those days when you just can't do it, and they've got you. Life is too short to be unhappy. Whatever brings you joy, go and do those things. Like I said, the last couple of years have been crazy, crazy hard, but I've never been happier. Thank you guys for listening. Great job, Melody. Good for you, Melody. Good job, Melody. Good for you, Melody. That's amazing. Um, you know what? Your story just told me, and I've heard your story. Uh, because I am a part of, Melody has a, a group online um, that you can follow her. She has a wonderful uh, Facebook group where she shares a lot of beautiful stuff and does a lot of lives. So I've heard snippets of your story um, here, there and everywhere, but I'll tell you something, Melody, I knew I had to have you on Storytellers because what your story tells us and teaches us and validates for others is that as women, we are survivors. As shitty as we can feel with the shit that we're going through sometimes, we always seem to figure out a way to make it through and to pivot and to look for those people, to look for the tribe, to 
figure out the resources, especially when we have children or dogs or, you know, we get it. I mean, I see some comments there too, with people saying, you know, I don't have dogs, but I get it. Right. Like, and that dog for you was e emotional support, right? Like that's like somebody trying to strip away a very big part of your emotional support while you're trying to deal with all this stuff. So kudos to you for everything that you've uh, persevered and endured and, and come through. Um, I am one of your biggest cheerleaders and uh, thank you. Um, I thought you could make so an much. appearance. Is there he is, there's <laughs> Oakley. My little there's pup. Oakley. My little boy. Oh, he's so cute. He's so <laughs> he's cute. Go back for those of you that don't know, Melody actually lives in the complex next to me. So she often hears me from the car yelling, screaming at her while she's out with the dog. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much, Melody. We appreciate you being here. I appreciate you helping me with all the tech stuff. Um, Melody has assured me that we have a taped version of the Zoom, so I will be able to um, get this out uh, in a better format for anybody to watch a replay. Um, so yeah, thank you, Melody. That was wonderful.